Welcome to Justice Matters. I'm Denise George, Attorney General of the U.S. Virgin Islands. Justice Matters is a program aimed to inform, engage, and empower you with knowledge of Virgin Islands laws that affect our everyday lives and our community. We have insightful discussions with special guests on the laws and related topics so you can be empowered to make a difference in our community. Today's topic is about the VI, the Virgin Islands joining the fight against opioids. A few months ago, I reported out that the Virgin Islands was set to receive nearly $8 million in settlement funds to fight the opioid abuse in the territory out of a settlement agreement with the nation's three major pharmaceutical distributors, Cardinal, McKesson, and Amerisource Bergen, as well as Johnson & Johnson. In 2020, the Virgin Islands, along with 52 states and territories, through their respective attorneys generals, filed what is called multi-state lawsuits against some of the largest pharmaceutical opioid manufacturers and distributors. The lawsuits are consumer protection actions based on unlawful practices committed against consumers by the makers and distributors of opioids in violation of Virgin Islands consumer and antitrust laws. We signed on to a settlement agreement that marks the culmination of three years of negotiations to resolve more than 4,000 claims of state and local governments across the country. It is the second largest multi-state agreement in U.S. history, second only to the Tobacco Master Settlement. The Virgin Islands, with the opioid settlements, will receive nearly $8 million and between 80 and 86.5% will go directly to advertising the opioid epidemic through a variety of remediation strategies such as media campaigns to prevent opioid misuse, training for healthcare providers, EMTs, law enforcement, and other first responders, and treatment and recovery support services for persons in the opioid use disorder and co-occurring substance abuse disorders. So what are opioids? Opioids are a class of drugs naturally found in the opium poppy plant that work in the brain to produce a variety of effects, including the relief of pain. Opioids can be prescription uh, medications, often referred to as painkillers, or they can be so-called street drugs, such as heroin, which is illegal. <laughs> Many prescription opioids are used to block pain signals between the brain and the body and are typically prescribed to treat moderate to severe pain. In addition to controlling pain, opioids can make some people feel relaxed, happy, or high, and can be very, very addictive and also lead to death. The most commonly used opioids are prescription opioids such as Oxycontin, Vicodin, and Fentanyl which is a synthetic opioid, um, 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Heroin, an illegal drug, is also an opioid. And what makes opioid medications effective for treating pain can also make them dangerous. At lower doses, opioids may make you feel sleepy, but higher doses can slow your breathing and heart rate, which too often have resulted in death. That is the basis of the opioid crisis nationwide. Therefore, today, I have joining me in this conversation, the Chief Deputy Attorney General, Carol Thomas Jacobs, who's gonna give us more detail of this $8 million settlement agreement and what it means to the Virgin Islands. Welcome to Justice Matters, Attorney Jacobs. Thank you for inviting me. What is this opioid settlement agreement all about? Well, there, there are several opioid settlement agreements that mm. the Virgin Island has been part of. Um, the settlement agreement, the opioid settlement agreement essentially a, 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 an agreement by a group of attorney generals with various distributors and pharmaceutical mm. companies, um, to resolve the opioid crisis. Okay. Now, when you talk about the group of uh, attorneys general, you're talking about throughout the nation, about how many of us is it that was involved in this particular agreement? All 50 states and territories 
uh, you know, have been involved and been part of these settlement agreements with the with the opioid um, entities. Okay, which is the ones um, the ones that we were involved in specifically? Okay, so we have been involved in the McKenzie. We we filed a lawsuit. Um, actually, we filed a lawsuit in the Virgin Islands against McKenzie. We entered into to a consent judgment. Um, McKenzie was a promoter. Mm -hmm. of opioids for many of the opioid manufacturers. They ad provide ad advertisement and, and uh, marketing services for the opioid manufacturers. We also filed lawsuits um, against Johnson & Johnson and the affiliates mm -hmm. and um, McKesson. Um, Johnson Johnson is one of the largest um, producer of oh, okay. opioid products yeah, in, yes, in the world. Right. Mm -hmm. And we also have um, McKesson, um, Cardinal Health, and Amerisource um, Bergen. We, these are the largest distributors of opioids in the nation. When we filed that lawsuit, we were alleging certain things. And, and what was that? Tell us what was that all about? Well, we allege that these um, companies violated the Virgin Islands um, consumer protection laws. Mm -hmm. uh, and that their deceptive practices, um, misrepresentations as to the uh, addictive nature of these opioids has caused and led to increase in the opioid crisis. And what about the opioid crisis in the Virgin Islands that were connected? What it's their well, connection, and what, what do and you know let the public know what 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 it is that we sh had to show with respect to why it is that it had an impact or their actions had an impact on our well, um, community. The reality is that there's opioids. You, you know, individuals, people in our community, they use opioids mm -hmm. to treat um, pain, or if they have cancer, um, if they have back pain, opioids are used. So we're talking about a wide distribution of opioids throughout the nation. And these are prescription and drugs, legal. Le yeah, these drugs. are legal. And then there are illegal ones. Yeah, these, these, these are legal mm -hmm. drugs, sometimes used illegally, mm -hmm. um, that are, are used throughout the Virgin Islands. So, what we, so we have these opioids, not only that, but we have opioid use, but we've also had a number of opioid deaths in the Virgin Islands. We've had a, a, a approximately five opioid deaths in the Virgin Islands since 2019. Oh, okay. So we are not immune from opioid abuse in the Virgin Islands. And sometimes we think that, you know, you can measure opioid abuse just under deaths alone, but there are lots of people in our community who are also suffering silently from opioid um, misuse. Okay. Um, and they, they, you know, so we can't just look at just the deaths. We have to look at the distribution of opioids in our community. And, and there's no question that is being distributed. And in that's our community. A, a very good point because we look at deaths, but we're not looking at the hospitalization. Exactly. We're not looking at the illnesses. People who are near, you know, nearly, you know, impacted by it. What are the allegations in Virgin Islands law? Um, they obviously in in our allegations that we are claiming that they um, they violated um, okay. some antitrust laws. Um, yeah, well, so tell us more about we, that. We 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 we, are, we we focus mainly on our consumer laws. Our mm -hmm. consumer laws in the Virgin Islands are dis are designed to protect the consumers of the Virgin Islands mm -hmm. from predatory practices mm -hmm. of companies and the opioid crisis. And we say crisis mm -hmm. is the way it is because of the predatory practices of many of these companies. Um, what they do, their focus was increasing opioid sale. That was the focus, with the, and downplaying the side effects or uh, the risk of addiction mm -hmm. to our consumers. Um, they also tend to ignore the fact that there may have been diversion um, strategies implemented by individuals. When I say diversion strategies, where individuals may you might find individuals who over prescribe it could be doctors who are over prescribing mm -hmm. you are you might be pharmacies that are over dispensing it might be patients who um create who who submit false prescriptions mm -hmm. um those are things that the these companies are required to pay attention to to take note of and 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 take action in the event that they are they 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 observe them what we find is that a lot of these companies were not doing anything they were more concerned with profit
Just selling it. Just selling and, it. And the, the pharmaceutical companies, they sell to the to the physicians. They to do. To the doctors. Yeah. So is it, um, where is the disconnect then? If they're not doing these things that they need to do to protect the consumer, as mm -hmm. far as advising of the risks and everything, is it that they're not telling the physicians? Is it that they're not including that in their materials? How is it that they go about not doing those things or not protecting the consumer when they distribute these um, painkillers that the doctors prescribe? Their goal was to increase sale. And so, of course, you, they, the individuals or the, the, the group that is going to be selling these drugs or presenting these drugs are the doctors. Mm -hmm. So you, 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 you encourage the doctors to use it. You downplay the side effects. Mm -hmm. You give the doctors, some of them, um, false information as to the side effects, the long-term effects of opioid use. Mm -hmm. And rather than saying that, well, individuals are being, are becoming addictive to opioid, you say, you know, they're not really addicted. They're having pseudo addiction, not real addiction. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the things that they do to, um, to oh. encourage, um, doctors to, to, to sell these opioid products, mm -hmm. that these are what's going to relieve pain um, mm -hmm. and the long-term benefits outweigh any temporary side effects that they may have. Mm -hmm. And we know now that is not the truth. This whole settlement is a combination of about three years of mm -hmm. intense negotiations and everything. I know we got into it just about three years ago. Yes. Um, and, and you talk about a multi-state Agreement. Just explain what that is and how we fit in and how we get into these multi-state. Well, generally, you know, the attorneys generals work together on a mm -hmm. lot of investigations. Mm -hmm. This is not the first, and it certainly won't be the last. In exactly. fact, they're, they're mm -hmm. ongoing investigations, some of which I can't tell you about. Yes, right now. always exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that, them that, always. that yes. attorneys general, they come together as mm -hmm. a community and they um, conduct investigations. And sometimes we decide to pursue um, litigation against mm -hmm. big companies. Right. And, it, you know, as I said, there is there is there's strength in numbers. Mm -hmm. So when the attorneys general come together to file a lawsuit against a big corporation like Johnson and Johnson and McKenna's mm -hmm. who can who have hundreds of lawyers. You know, we are able to really have a strong legal force and legal team mm -hmm. to, to, to defend these actions. Mm -hmm. That's that's really, really what I love about these multi-state um, type attorneys general uh, lawsuits, because we are small territory. Exactly. And then there are the big states uh, who are involved in it with a lot more resources. But sometimes when we get together, it, it's just like you said, this power in numbers. Yeah. We get to then represent our consumers in our small little neck of the woods, as they say, but then we're able to to really, you know, um, advocate in ways that it would have been more difficult had we not been able to join, had I not been able to join with all of the attorneys general's offices throughout the country. Exactly, because mm -hmm. for the small territory like the Virgin Islands to sue mm -hmm. big corporations like Johnson & Johnson, yes. you know, it would, it, would call, it would take much of our resources. This is the second largest settlement nationwide, and next to the uh, the the tobacco settlement, which we were also a part of. Yes, it is. It is. We were part of the tobacco settlement, but since tobacco, the opioid opioid settlements have been the largest. Mm -hmm. With respect to the Johnson and Johnson and the distributors, we're talking about approximately twenty six billion. Um, in terms of McKenzie, McKenzie was approximately six hundred million. Um, we also have Marlin Croft, which is about 233 million. Mm -hmm. um, so these are, these are significant settlements um, by, by, by the state's attorneys general. So then, so then um, when we get to the settlement, those are really large amounts. How is it determined how much the Virgin Islands gets or, or how much each state or county or everything? What, what's that process as okay. far as what? So, you know, this is, this is really an intense process by the attorneys mm -hmm. general. And so there's a lot of discussions, right. um, a lot of proposal and suggestion as to how we, you know, attorneys, the different states um, should divide up that money. Mm -hmm. But generally, um, it's determined by population and mm -hmm. we have a small population. And it's also de determined, especially in the opioid case, by se severity. Um, compared to the number of debts that we have, our, our numbers of, our number of debts compared to like Florida or West Virginia, Ohio is mm -hmm. really small. And it's done um, in that per capita basis. And it's done under the impact. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So in certain states, you have really, um, the, 
opioid crisis is really devastating to those communities mm -hmm. and as compared to the Virgin Islands. So it, all those things are taken into consideration in deciding settlement amount. Well, that's what I like. And we're going to talk, of course, more about the settlement amount and what we're getting and how we get it. But I think that that's important to know that we don't, we don't have to, an advantage is that we don't have to wait until it's a super crisis, at super crisis proportions. You know, we, we we're able to then get it where it's, we might be able, we'll be able to start managing it. In the Virgin Islands, we tend to kind of get the, the, the get, we, we tend to find in a situation that it affects us later. Mm -hmm. So it's not that we're not going to have an opiate crisis. Right. It's going to come. But lucky for us, we have the resources now. We to can prevent, prevent it, it now. Right. right. From, yeah, exactly. And that's awesome. So that's what yeah. these settlements will do. So hopefully we'll never get to the to the to the level of other states. Okay, and we, we probably won't once we apply once what we, it is we're getting now. So let's exactly. talk about what we're getting. So the the amount that we are getting, our share, so to speak, at least for this lawsuit mm -hmm. regarding those three companies, the three pharmaceutical companies that mm -hmm. we're dealing with mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, what is it that we're, we're getting? Well, the, the, we're getting approximately in excess of eight million mm -hmm. over a number of years mm -hmm. um, from the distributor settlement. And also from Johnson and Johnson, and also we have McKenzie, and we also have the Marlin Croft um, settlement. So we're getting in excess of eight million dollars, and these monies are paid over time. Okay. In fact, we have received some of the settlement funds. Okay, about how much have we received so far? Okay, so far, we have received about one hundred and fifty-four thousand from the McKenzie settlement, mm -hmm. and we have received um, about three hundred and. 5,000 in excess of 305,000 from the distributor settlement agreement. Okay, so that's almost a half a million dollars exactly. already has come in has come as in. a result of, exactly. of this settlement agreement. Where does that money go? And is it, and I know that it is, um, well, I know where it goes. But I want the public to understand where that money goes because sometimes we have settlements like this one mm -hmm. where it is specifically detailed as to what and how on what and how the money is spent? Well, the settlement agreements are very specific. The, the purpose of the settlement is to remediate and abate the opioid crisis. And mm -hmm. that's what the money should be used for. Mm -hmm. um, each of the settlement agreements specifically outlines what the monies can be used for. So these monies have to be placed in a separate and distinct and a discrete fund mm -hmm. that the Virgin Island, that we can use mm -hmm. to fund certain programs for remediation and abatement of the opioid crisis. And, um, that that they pursuant to the settlement agreement. Okay, good. And, and what do we have to do? What steps do we need to take as a result of the requirements and the terms of the settlement in order to administer these funds once they start coming in? Once these funds are coming in, we need we would need legislation to ensure that the funds are used and appropriated for a specific purpose. Not only that, but the settlements require the establishment of committees, of these committees or council mm -hmm. to, to advise the Commission of Health, who is really responsible for addressing um, opioid issues, mm -hmm. um, to advise the, the, the Commission of Health on how to best use these funds to address the opioid crisis. Mm -hmm. the opioid crisis. And that legislation would be underway for, for you know, the, the legislature is basically consistent with um, the the requirements legislation consistent with the requirements yes, of the settlement those, agreement. That legislation we've already drafted it, mm -hmm. and that legislation will come before will the legislature. Be, good, good, good. We we we're talking about three companies uh, that you mentioned, three pharmaceutical companies. Well, three well, categories of pharmacies. Okay, so we talk about McKenzie, who mm -hmm. was the um, promoter. They basically serve as the promoters of opioid for the for the opioid companies. They worked mm -hmm. with Purdue and so on, promoting opioid opioids mm -hmm. to increase the sale of opioids. Then we have the McKesson Cardinal Health and Amery Source Virgin. Mm -hmm. These are the distributors of the opioids. Mm -hmm. We have Johnson and Johnson, which is like the manufacturer of, of mm -hmm. opioid. They're one of the largest manufacturers of opioids in the world. But we have other companies that we we expect, you know, um, or they should be, or they may be um, settlements with them. We have Teva, who just recently announced a tentative agreements with the attorneys general. Mm -hmm. And that agreement was for $4.25 billion. 
So hopefully we would share in, 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 in that settlement also. Okay. It's, and, but we, we joined in that already. We, we so have already, we, yes. So likely we, we would be sharing, sharing it, it as well. Uh, to talk about Purdue. That's usually the big one that everyone hears about. You know, Purdue, Purdue, you know, so, but, but has that or has that become a part of this settlement? Or had we joined in any? We have, we have joined in, that? we have joined in all this, the settlements. Mm -hmm. um, we have not received any funds from Purdue. Purdue filed for bankruptcy. So it's a little mm -hmm. complex when it comes to Purdue, but we hope, hopeful that one day we will also benefit from that mm -hmm. agreement. Okay. And, and then as, as we continue to work together, that'll happen. Well, we know that, okay, we talked about in every settlement agreement, there are responsibilities on both sides. Right. So we know about the responsibility of legislation um, to, to, and the, the, on our side, as well as the expenditure of funds for specific purposes mm -hmm. to address the opioid situation in the Virgin Islands. So what about what they have to do, the, de the, the defendants, I would say, or the, the persons of pharmaceutical companies, particularly in this particular settlement of um, these three entities? Okay, so... One of the important terms mm -hmm. in, in the settlement is injunctive relief. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we always think about the money, which mm -hmm. is good. Mm -hmm. It's good for the Virgin Islands. But injunctive relief is, is, is really a tool used by attorneys general in many of these lawsuits. Absolutely. Because mm -hmm. that is really what's going to give us change. Right. It's true injunctive relief that we're going to ensure that the defendants do not continue in the illegal acts. Mm -hmm. So... By in, by by them agreeing to certain injunctive relief, what we will do will ensure that the consumers are told the truth about these these drugs. Mm -hmm. um, we will ensure that the 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 various due diligence that is required by these pharmaceutical companies to ensure that there's no diversion of opiate drugs or mm -hmm. or get sale to unauthorized persons that right. they will ensure that they have to do their due diligence. They'll pay more attention. Mm -hmm. They need to hire individuals to ensure that um, when they see red flags, they, they, they address those, those red flags. Mm -hmm. um, education for the public um, in terms of, and also for the doctors, letting them know the truth about opioid mm -hmm. um, crisis so that you can inform consumers who you are prescribing um, opioids to the truth mm -hmm. and, and the risk associated with taking these drugs. So there's a lot of um, obligations that we, um, we've placed on these, the attorneys generals have placed on these entities to ensure that this type of, this opioid crisis is addressed at every level. Right. Not just we have the resources, but they also take action. What's next as far as what we may have to do with what the assistant, what, well, what the attorneys general have to do? Well, one of the things, well, we have to, first, we have to ensure that at least a traditional community has to ensure that these companies are doing what they agreed to do. We mm -hmm. have to ensure that. But we have an obligation too. Mm -hmm. We have to take steps, use the funds we have to abate the opioid crisis. Um, so we have to do training. We have to train our first responders. We have to train our um, emergency personnel. We have, to, we have to train anyone who come into contact with individuals who may be exposed to op opioid abuse. We have to train our, our community on the use of naloxone, naloxone which is the, the drug, the life-saving drug, mm -hmm. if someone is find themselves overdosed from opioid. We have to make sure we do research, mm -hmm. keep adequate data mm -hmm. as to opioid use, opioid misuse um, in the Virgin Islands. There are lots of things we have the resources to do to support individuals who find themselves in a crisis to provide, and, and we're talking about wraparound services that we can provide to these individuals from, you know, in, individuals in the criminal justice system as a result of opioid addiction. There are yeah. lots of things we can do, use that those funds for that we receive to, to ensure that we ensure recovery and abatement of the opioid crisis, mm -hmm. recovery, and, in, recovery of individuals and abatement of the opioid crisis. Okay. And, 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 and all about mainly going towards prevention as well. Prevention and, and, and definitely prevention. prevention, talking to the, to our young people in the schools, mm -hmm. in, in the community, mm -hmm. to let them know the dangers of mm -hmm. opioid addiction. And, 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 and it's all really under the, uh, the Department of Health. 
it the is, commissioner it, of health as, as managing over this. And of course, we know they have the, the mental health division um, and they deal with substance abuse and mental uh, health issues. And so that's going to really be where the lead is in, in, in the expenditures of these funds. And, and addressing the problems, right? That is correct. But mm -hmm. also, we, we still have our role because we want to make sure that those funds, as your attorney general mm -hmm. office, we want to make sure that those funds are used appropriately. And how do we do that as far as the legislation and the setup, the structure of, of, of expending these funds and well, using them for what they Well, we have reporting requirements mm -hmm. under these agreements. We have reporting requirements um, to the administrators of these funds because these are complex um, structures that's been set up to manage these funds for mm -hmm. all the states and territories. So we have reporting requirements. So we want to make sure that when we file our yearly reports, that we have complied with the terms of these agreements mm -hmm. and ensure that those monies are being used appropriately and for the specific purpose mm -hmm. to set forth in the agreements. Mm -hmm. And as required, the, the establishment of a committee or a board, as far mm -hmm. as the legislation mm -hmm. um, is concerned, the attorney general is sitting on the board, the, whether it be, it as, be it as a voting member or non-voting member, that is the importance of having the Attorney General's office on that board with respect that, to making sure of compliance with the terms of the agreement. Right? That That is correct. We want mm -hmm. to make sure that we also, on that board, we want to have stakeholders in the community too. Right. We want to make sure that, you know, because we may not know everything, but we know there are people out there who have knowledge, who may have experienced addiction, who work with people with addiction and mental disorder. We want them to be part of that board Absolutely. to, to Absolutely. assist us in making sure that we are spending that money, diverting that money to, to the greatest, to areas where we know we have the greatest need. Mm -hmm. What would you say is the biggest takeaway that you think that the consumers, that the, the public are there, our audience is there, that they should take away from this whole process as we're going into the settlement and what we're going to be doing with it? Well, I think as you know, as a consumer, as consumers, we also have personal obligation mm -hmm. to ensure that we, when we go to our healthcare providers, that we ask questions. Mm -hmm. We ask them what are the side effects. Don't be afraid. Don't feel intimidated. Mm -hmm. um, how long do I need to take this this medication? Is this good for me? Um, is it going to cause other side effects? We as consumers have an obligation also to ensure that we inform ourselves, go research. There are lots of information on the internet. Although some people won't, will tell you, don't go to the internet, go to the internet. Now go to the good sites. Go to the, the good the sites. The really reputable the ones. The, good, the yeah. reputable sites, the good sites. Mm -hmm. um, read about some of these drugs. Make sure that when your when, when your doctor gives you a prescription, you know, there's that little label that they mm -hmm. give you. M many people just take the drugs. Mm -hmm. They don't read it. They don't do the research. And, 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 and ask, is this an opioid? Mm -hmm. Sometimes doctors just prescribe stuff. They don't expect to ask. Is this an exactly. opioid? Is there an alternative to this op to this type of medication? Do the research. Mm -hmm. Because remember, your life may be at stake. You do not want to find yourself addicted to a drug unwittingly. So ask the question. Thank you very much, uh, Attorney Jacobs. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Justice Matters.